Is law school all about cutthroat competition? Not if you attend Duke Law. Duke Law prides itself on providing students with, and I'm quoting now, a framework for ethical growth, engagement, and professional development in a strong collaborative community. Sound good? Let's learn more about Duke Law in this interview with its Senior Director of Admissions. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Thanks for joining me for the 481st episode of Admission Straight Talk. Are you applying to law school this cycle? Are you planning ahead to apply to law school next year or later? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted's law school admissions quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash law dash quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your qualifications and your chances of acceptance. And it's all free. Again, take the short quiz at exhibit.com slash law dash quiz to obtain your free assessment. Now for today's interview, I'm delighted to have an admissions story talk, Mark Hill, Senior Director of Admissions at Duke Law. Mark earned his bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology from Duke, and then later earned a master's in higher ed from Northwestern, where he also served as Assistant Director of Admissions. In 2002, he moved to Raleigh and Duke Law, starting as an admissions officer. Since 2013, he has served Duke Law as Senior Director of Admissions. Mark, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you, Linda. Great to be here. Uh, great to have a chance to, to talk to you and uh, share a little bit of information. I'll start by saying that Duke is in Durham, not Raleigh. Uh, oh my goodness, where did local. I get that from? I'm sorry. You know, even <laughs> as I said that, I thought that was wrong. Yeah, I knew that. Okay. Uh, where did I get that from? I have no idea. All right. Well, the airport then, is Raleigh Durham, which confuses people. It's like that might have been it. Yeah, that might have been it. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Um, can you give us an overview of the more distinctive elements of the Duke Law School JD program? Sure. Uh, you know, the way that I think about sort of what characterizes Duke has two elements. And one is that we're among a handful of really top tier sort of national law schools with students that come from all over have really great job prospects, you know, all across the country. Um, so not, I mean, in fact, most of our grads don't stay in North Carolina, but they're looking elsewhere. So, right, so there's, you know, there's a handful of, of law schools like that. And in that cohort, I think the other thing that makes us distinctive is that we have a relatively small class size. We're in a smaller city, not a tiny little town. Durham's coming up on 300,000 people right now, That's but nice a smaller school and really a focus on individual attention to students and, and helping everybody who comes here sort of craft their own course through the opportunities at Duke to get to where they, they want to end up. And because it's a smaller school in a smaller city, we really attract folks who are intending to be full-time law students. And so they're just really focused on, uh, on engaging with one another and with their professors uh, in a way that, you know, I mean, I, I, I suppose it's not for everybody, but for people who really want that kind of full-on focused experience, it, it can be really great. i often mention a couple of distinctive dual degrees. We have two JD LLM degrees that can be completed actually in the, the three years that it would take to do a JD. So they don't add any additional time, but you can get a really good concentration and, uh, and an LLM focusing either on international and comparative law and all the spectrum of the things that that means from public law to you know finance and, and corporate transactions. Uh, and then the other one focuses on law and entrepreneurship. So That's what I saw. you yeah. want to be a lawyer who works in the startup space, who works with venture capital. Maybe you have entrepreneurial ideas of your own. Maybe you'd like to work for a startup. Maybe you just want to work in, you know, for law firms that help provide legal services to those kinds of companies. Uh, the JDLLM and law and entrepreneurship is a great thing there. So those are sort of specific Duke dual degrees. Of course, we have dual degrees with graduate programs, uh, JDMBA and stuff like that. But I like to mention those as things that are particular, uh, particularly distinctive about Duke. Right. Especially the entrepreneurship program. I mean, the, the, an LLM and international is a little bit more common, but uh, entrepreneurship right. is definitely distinctive. And this part of North Carolina has a lot of tech and startup activity because of Duke and UNC and North Carolina State, uh, three major research universities in this area. A lot of big tech companies actually moving in here, Google and Apple, and, and I think, uh, well, not Facebook, but Meta 
just said that they're <laughs> moving in, but a lot of startup activity as well. So it's, it was a natural fit, not only because there's a growing demand for lawyers with those skills across the board, sure. but because Duke in particular is in a really good place to help our students connect with uh, with some experiences in that realm. Right. And Duke, Duke Fuqua, the business school is also very mm -hmm. entrepreneurially or oriented. Yep. Um, okay. Well, thank you for, for highlighting that. Now, and oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. It's a, a three-year combined degree, or is there an additional year required for, to complete the LLM? You do do them both in three years. Uh, wow. One component of it is a summer experience. So you would do after the first year of law school in the summer, the international LLM students will go to the Netherlands. They study at the University of Leiden. We help them line up a placement with a public interest or organization or law firm outside the U.S. Similarly, there's sort of a startup boot camp for the LLM LE students, either here uh, in North Carolina, or I think this summer, sometimes they do go uh, to Silicon Valley and participate in a, a, Duke in, a Duke in Silicon Valley program out there. But that's part of the way that you get some additional academic credit and it allows you to complete them in three years with no additional time on the back end. And they still, the second year, they would still go for a typical internship, right? The, the summer yes. between the second and third right. year. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Now, last year, uh, 2021, saw, I could say, a surge in applications to all law schools. And when I checked, it was it was June 12th when I checked, uh, LSAC overall applicant volume was actually down from last year, about 11.3%, but still up a little bit, 3.4% from two years ago. What is Duke Law experiencing? Pretty much the same. Uh, we saw a very significant increase in applications for the 2020, 2021 application cycle. I'm, try, I'm trying to remember what the exact percentage was, but really significant. And this year is down a bit from that peak, but still considerably higher than where we had been running, uh, you know, pretty steadily around 5,000 applications, uh, more or less, for the years before that. I mean, we're, we're down about 10%, 10 or 15% from that incredible peak mm -hmm. previously, but that still was a very, very strong applicant pool, not only in terms of numbers, but in terms of the, you know, the, at least sort of the, the crude elements of quality. Um, and also just from reading them, there were a lot of really great folks who applied as well. Right, right. I'm just curious, this is not, you know, this, this question just came to my head. Obviously, there's a lot of talk right now about a recession, the stock market just went down. I don't know mm -hmm. what it's doing today. Um, obviously, inflation is up. Do you, believe that uh, if a recession does hit, that it will affect the law school application numbers? And if so, how is law school typically affected? What's well, an interesting thing, you know, I mean, I've been at Duke for 20 years this fall, so I've seen several sort of Congratulations. cycles. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of times graduate school, law school applications, professional school applications are a little bit counter cyclical. So Absolutely. that when the economy is bad, people are graduating from college and think, well, I I'm not going to get a job right now. Maybe I'll get some additional qualifications and try to ride this out. Um, so the big, the, the thing that I think about is uh, the, the 2008 recession. And, and what we saw there was an initial increase in applications to law school. Uh, and then people realized that it actually was also affecting the legal employment market. And, and the, so there was sort of a lag and then a decline after that. Um, I hope it would be the same thing this time around. What we saw was that Duke grad and I think graduates from most of the, the, the top law schools still had good job prospects, uh, even, you know, even in that downturn, the, the kinds of law firms that hire our students still were interested in, in hiring them. So I think we, our, our students did a little bit better than the overall job market in the previous recession. And depending on what happened, uh, hopefully would, would do somewhat, you know, would do similar. And we do have great, great career services folks to, to help guide them through that process. And that's another example of where being at a school that's you know able to pay attention to you as an individual is going to be very helpful. And you know, you in particular, how are you going to maximize your opportunities and tell your story and really be able to, you know, to fare well even in a more challenging job market? Right. Let's turn to the application, something that applicants can definitely influence, if not control. Now, Duke accepts the GRE or the LSAT. Approximately what percentage of the applicant pool is applying with the GRE? I had to actually do a little bit of statistics because I didn't, I had some impressionistic ideas. Uh, this is only the second year for us of accepting the GRE. Oh, really? Okay. So, 
Um, it's a relatively small number. It turned out when I when I actually looked, I knew it wasn't very many. It turned mm -hmm. out to be about three or four percent oh, in wow. the last two years of our applicant pool uh, applying with GRE scores. So correspondingly, it's a it's a relatively small number uh, of our offers of admission, and then um, you know it's been less less than five uh, enrolling. Uh, last year and looks like going to be this year as well, who, who only have GRE scores. Uh, right. So still relatively new for us and a pretty small part of our process. So you're not really able to talk about how well they're doing as a group or anything like that. The number is really too small. No, right? we haven't had, you know, we haven't even had them get to, to 3L year yet, yeah. uh, let alone graduating. Um, so yeah, I think we're still learning a little bit of how to evaluate those scores. Of course, I mean, it, it's, it's a different test. It presents the results in a different way with where you actually have the subsection scores um, and have to think about, well, what does it mean that there's this big split between the quantitative and the verbal section? Whereas with the LSAT, you know, if, if they actually told us this person did really great on the, on the logical reasoning and not, you know, like, I don't know what we would, we would, we maybe would be more used to, to thinking about those things rather than just getting a, an aggregate score from, from the LSAT. Um, but we're, you know, we're really the intention when we adopted the GRE score, when we, you know, when we said we're, because you know, we did a lot of thinking with our faculty and, and the admissions committee, you know, does it make sense for us to do this? Other schools were starting to, uh, but we didn't want to do it just because other schools were doing it. So we thought a lot about, does this really make sense? And, and we wouldn't have done it if we weren't confident that the GRE can give us useful information that, that we're able to, to make good decisions with. Sure. How should applicants choose which test to take and submit? I, it, it, I think it depends on their, their individual circumstances. I mean, I think for us and for most law schools, we really do know the LSAT better and just feel more, more comfortable, you know, interpreting those scores. But like I said, we, we never wanted there to be a strategic advantage in choosing one over the other. So it depends a bit on, you know, if you take some practice tests, which one sort of makes, fits with the, the way that you think about things and, and the, you know, and the way that you would approach the test, um, how much time you have to prep. Um, I was actually talking to someone, a, a prospective student the other day who was asking me like how, you know, or, or was saying she was planning to take the GRE, how are we going to look at that? And I was just curious because I didn't, didn't, hadn't had a chance to talk to a lot of people. I was like, how, how did you make that decision? One of the things she stressed was uh, just the flexibility. You know, the L LSAC has done a great job in increasing the availability of the LSAT, the number of times you can take it, the ability to take it from home. GRE does still offer more flexibility there to, to take it on your own schedule. Um, and that may be appealing for some people. But I right. think more, I think the decision ought to be more based on the individual applicant's sense of what's going to fit their timeline best and their testing abilities best and less of a strategic thing about what what are we looking for um, and then of course the I mean I think one of the things that a lot of schools thought about and, and we did as well I don't think we've seen this as much but if you're applying to dual degree program uh, to a JD MBA uh, if you're already in a PhD program and have a GRE score then again you know it makes sense if you've got a score already right. then not, right. not to take another test just for the sake of, of that. Makes sense. Now, LSAC seems to be moving to uh, removal of the testing requirement for law school admissions. If LSAC were to leave it up to the schools whether to require a test or not, do you see Duke retaining the testing requirement, issuing waivers, which means they would some would be required and some would not be required to take the test, or making the test entirely optional? And why? Well, I, I guarantee if it was up to LSAC, <laughs> that, 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 that a test would be required. I'm sorry, the not the, I'm the ABA. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, doing yeah, great yeah. this morning. Uh, the, the ABA it's the ABA, yeah. Physical, um, and probably likely to, to move forward. Um, yeah. And so, of course, we're thinking about it. It's a relatively recent development. I think there still is value in, in tests, not just as another hoop to jump through, but I think about how many times we see people who, you know, maybe didn't weren't in a good place when they started their college career, um, you know, maybe just throughout their time in college and they're, you know, they're 10 years out from, from graduating and have done a lot since then and are able to present a test that gives us more grounded confidence that they're ready to perform well in law school. 
uh, as opposed to just them saying, hey, I'm right, no, I know I could do better. Uh, like presenting a test definitely gives us, you know, gives us the ability to, to say there's a specific reason that we might feel, feel like this is somebody that we want to admit. And a lot of cases like that. So I don't think we would want to go without that. I doubt, I, it would, again, you know, I think given how we thought about the GRE, this is not going to be my decision alone. It's going to be something that sure. I'm going to weigh in on and, and so forth. Um, I think we would want to give probably some flexibility uh, to allow people, you know, some ability, you know, if they felt comfortable that their record was strong and, and said what it needed to say, then I think we would want to give some flexibility while still encouraging people to provide it if, if they think it will round out the, the, the overall picture that we're getting of their uh, record and their ability. Because it definitely, you know, I mean, there are some people who aren't good test takers and are otherwise really great and it, they'll be glad not to have to do it. But there are, I know there are people because I've seen them and we've admitted them and we've graduated them and they're great who, who really will benefit from another opportunity to say, look, my college grades aren't fully representative of who I am right now. And, and I wouldn't want them to lose the chance to do that. Right. Um, you know, obviously business schools, I'm sure you realize has kind of gone down this path already. Mm -hmm. And when they first started going test optional or issuing test waivers, it was the beginning of COVID almost, almost exclusively. There might've been a few before then, but it was mostly the beginning of COVID. And at the time it was, if you imagined a, a two by two graph, it was, you know, those people who are really good test takers and those people who have other evidence that they can do well. And basically it was those people who are good test takers, you know, if they, they have more reason to take the test. Mm -hmm. If people have poor, poor grades or poor academic record or not an academic record that reflects that well on them and they're good test takers, they should definitely take the test. You know, if they have that not optimal academic record, and they're weaker test takers. Well, it's a question mark. You know, it was it was that kind of a, a, a graph. But there's, you know, from my experience, both with law school applicants and and business school applicants, where you have this test optionality in some cases or test waivers being issued. I mean, the the test can work both ways depending upon the individual. Right, and it and you know, I think it advantages and disadvantages people now when it's you know when it's required. So you know, it, who 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 benefits and who doesn't may change. But I hope that we would be able to manage this transition, whatever whatever guidance or instructions were given by right. by the APA, in a way that in a way that lets us use the information we have to make to make good choices and and bring people to do who are are going to do well and and be you know and make con contributions to our law school community, but to the legal, you know, the legal community at large. So yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yes, absolutely. We live in interesting times. Now Duke has a regular decision and an early decision option. Can you review those, those different options? Sure. So this is pretty similar to what people may be familiar with from applying to college. So regular decision is you apply, we work on a rolling admission basis. So not necessarily a set time frame, but it's sometime after that, after your application is complete, we'll review it and give you a decision uh, without waiting for one date in the spring to release those decisions, right? So I think that's one of the big differences for most law schools. Our early decision, we have two rounds of a binding early decision application. So just as with many colleges, this is um, early decision, not early action. So you're saying, if I'm admitted to Duke, uh, I will enroll, I will withdraw my other applications, I won't submit any more application, you're admitted, you're definitely coming to Duke. And so you like folks who want to be here, that's a, you know, that's a helpful thing. So sometimes people might, you know, might want to think about uh, showing that level of, of commitment and, and interest. It removes the ability to compare scholarship offers from other schools. I, I think it's always important to say that for us, everybody goes through the same scholarship review process and uh, being on that committee, I know that people admitted early decision receive the same scholarship award that they would have received had they been admitted regular decision, but they are, whether they like that, whether they like that, that, offer, that scholarship award or not, they're still committed to coming to Duke. So it removes the chance to say, well, this other school's okay and they gave me more money. Uh, so you have to be prepared to take what, you know, whatever is offered. And I think that's really important to think about because obviously the cost of law school is something that is, is rightly on 
uh, most applicants' minds. It should be if it's not. And so, you know, how important that is and that ability to weigh other offers is one factor. It's a relatively small part of our application process. And I think, again, about the college, you know, the college admissions process where my colleagues in Duke's undergraduate admissions office, probably they take at least half of their wow. uh, their freshman class through through the through the early decision application. So there's a real strategic sense that for college applicants, oh, I, you have to be early decision somewhere. Um, and I don't think it's nearly as big a part of the law school process. Certainly not for us. I mean, it averages maybe 15 or 20 percent. Of the class, do the different rounds have different acceptance rates? One of the things that I saw when I when I actually crunched some numbers on this is how highly variable it is. Oh, really? So it really just depends on who applies early decision in a given year. But the criteria are are the same. I, I think anybody in a given in a given year, I, I, early decisions really are not as much about comparing the overall that like that early decision pool as just is this somebody that we think we want to admit, because whereas overall we have a target class size, we're hoping to enroll about 220 students, I don't have a sense going into the year how many ought to be, how many will be admitted through early decision. So we're really just looking at that and saying, is this somebody that we want to admit, rather than, oh, we have to fill X percent of the class through our early decision pool, and we're going to take you know the best percent X, of however yeah. many apply. We're just looking at them and saying, is this somebody that we think is good? Um, and I think what happens often with people who, who apply early decision is we might look at them and say, this is somebody who looks pretty good. And you know, usually the people who choose to apply early decision are, are solid, but not the, you know, the very top of our applicant pool, because usually those folks know that they're going you know, to probably be competitive at a variety of schools. But most of the time, people who are applying early decision are people who are you know, solid students, but want to maximize their opportunities and give themselves a little bit of a boost. And so it's often the case that we're looking at people saying, regular decision, you know, we might or might not admit this person. They'd probably be on the wait list at least. But because we know that they're committed to coming, we know that they're really interested in Duke, they're going to be enthusiastic community members, we might go ahead and admit them. You know, that, that would give somebody the push to be admitted rather than be put on the wait list. So that's sort of the, the place where, where it makes a difference. But, I, you know, you'd, have, you'd really... There's a lot of variation, and I do. I did think maybe it's because I read them all at once, but you know, I think there are also a fair chunk of people who apply through early decision because they think it's going to work a miracle for them, and they're just, I mean, they're not competitive candidates. Right. Um, they don't have strong records, and there, I feel like there may be a little bit more more of a concentration of those in the early decision pool. Really? That it would, take, I'd have to do some more statistical it's analysis it's okay. to, to figure that right. out. Well, thank you. That's an interesting response. Thank you. At Duke Law, is full-time work experience a nice to have or really important to the admissions committee? Uh, I noticed that the average age in the class profile for the class that entered last fall is 23.4 years of age, although the age range is 20 to 38. I'm assuming that av the average and range imply that a significant percentage of students have full-time work experience or other graduate education. I think, yeah, that, that is true. Uh, the way that it works out is usually that somewhere around a third of our class has just graduated from college. 30 or 40% have spent a year or two doing other things before they start law school. And then kind of that longer tail of people with more substantial careers and, and so forth. That's the way it works out. We're not trying to produce those results. That's just sort of a function of, of the applicant pool. There are plenty of great folks who are graduating from college, really thoughtful about their interest in a legal career and, and confident in where they're going, uh, have been involved in their college communities, have, you know, maybe they've had not full-time employment, but, you know, had internships, had jobs, had uh, volunteer experiences, uh, such that we really feel comfortable knowing that they know how to work with other people and that they are, they're going to do well. You know, one of the things that we think about is, uh, not only are you going to engage with your classmates, but how are you likely to do in, you know, in a job interview when you have on-campus interviews? Yeah. Uh, do you know how to, and, you know, and, and how are you going to do when you have that opportunity? Do you know how to collaborate with other people? So that's one reason that we actually, several years ago, specifically began requesting that when people submit two letters of recommendation, uh, at least one of them does come from a non-academic source. We definitely still want to hear about people's classroom performance. 
But if possible, we really like to hear about how they do outside the classroom. And that, like I said, that could be from an employer or lots of other things. So I, you know, I think that often people who have taken that time to do things before they start law school have, have benefited from that. They've learned some things sure. about themselves. They've got some, some life skills and so forth. Uh, so it's definitely not a must have. We really take each application, each candidate kind of on their own terms. Um, but more people than not, are getting some experience after they graduate from college. And just my my advice is always that people should think carefully about that. And I think the default should be, I'm going to be, uh, you know, be out of school for a while. And it really ought to be a specific decision to go straight from college to law school. That shouldn't be the default. What, I assume everybody's going to do that. Thank you. Now, in terms of, of the work experience or the extracurricular experience, whatever you want to call it, do you prefer to see something that's closely related to law, like working in a law office or a legal clinic, for example, or volunteering in that capacity? Or is it just the fact that you did something that was meaningful and had impact and contributed in some way? Again, I think we're not specifically expecting everyone to have had focused experience in, in the legal world. Um, it makes total sense that lots of people who are thinking about a legal career will have done that. Um, and I'm interested in hearing what they've learned from that. What they, you know, what what did they do? How did that help to shape the direction that they think that they're heading? But you know, there are plenty of folks who have had interesting experiences, you know, in in other disciplines, and have realized how that touches on legal issues. So I think about, I think we see it a lot at Duke because I think because we have a pretty strong curriculum and faculty in uh, environmental law, and so you know that you think about the people who have been environmental science majors, they've had those kinds of internships. Uh, maybe they've worked, you know, in that field before they think about a legal career, but they've started to see how environmental regulation has been important to the things that they care about. Um, you know, they, they, and they see how they see lawyers doing things and they say, oh, that's what I want to do. And so that, that you know, that can work really well also. Um, or I, I don't want to discount, you know, people who just take a little while, a little while and try a bunch of different things before they they figure out what, what direction they're headed. And maybe all of the pieces don't fit together in that nice sort of single stream. But by the time, hopefully by the time they're applying to law school, they're able to sort of pull some of those threads together and say, well, I've done these different things. And, and this is kind of how I've gotten to this point now. So sure, I, lots of people will have law firm experience or work in DC or state, you know, state houses, legislative yeah. stuff. And I think that you, you, of course, you see a lot of that for, from, from law students, but it's certainly not a requirement or an expectation. Okay, great. Thank you. Now the Duke Law website gives applicants a lot of latitude in terms of what they can include in their personal statement and length. Mm -hmm. Should the applicant either in the personal statement or the optional essay number one address their interest in attending law school and Duke specifically? I'd love it if they did. <laughs> okay, that's a great um, answer. That answers the question. Our, our optional essay specifically asks that yeah. question, mm -hmm. uh, optional essay one, whereas, the, as you say, the personal statement kind of leaves it open. I think more so somewhere in the course of an application, I really hope to get some insight into why you're thinking about a legal career. Um, and maybe that in, for some people, that's going to be much more detailed and much more fully developed than for others, right? So not necessarily like to just, I mean, go back to the environmental example or, you know, I, I wanna be a tax lawyer, but something has made you do this rather than applying to uh, my colleagues across the street at the public policy school or not going to graduate school at all. So like something about why this is the path that you're following. Because you have other optional essays, you're able to go in other directions as well. That's not necessarily the only thing that you're gonna talk about in the Duke mm -hmm. Law application. Somewhere along the line, I'd like to hear something about that. If you see things that connect with those interests, with those goals, specifically at Duke, environmental law clinic, of course. Uh, you know, different things like that, it's great to the draw LLM those and entrepreneurship. Right, right. Um, but I think that that maybe is to some extent less important. I mean, like I said, we love to see it, but at the time that people are applying and apply to you know ten or fifteen law schools, and they may not have delved too deeply into the specific offering. So hopefully, uh, even if people haven't seen how those things connect at the time that they apply, um, if we admit them and kind of have some conversations with them, we're, and then they'll, they'll eventually find where those things connect. So that's maybe a little, I, I, I would caution people from feeling like you have to have that piece of it in there. And so therefore just going to the website and going, oh, here's a class 
here's a professor and sort of having this plug in uh, this little plug in element where you know where you, it, it's obvious that you didn't you know that it's not super woven into the rest of what you're what you're talking about if it's natural for that to come out as, as you write your personal statement or the optional essay then do it we'd love to hear it but don't feel like you have to force it okay great thank you for that, that excellent answer any guidelines on length uh, as long as it needs to be and no longer <laughs> um, so usually about two pages is is where personal statements end up um and the optional essays, uh, you know, one to two pages is is fine. It does don't don't write more than you need to write. But I wouldn't ever want to put a hard and fast page length or character limit and prevent somebody from telling a story that's more complicated. The, the mm-hmm. important thing is that we want to hear what the applicant has to say about their experiences uh, and what they think we need to know. And sometimes that is more involved. And so d- I wouldn't cut that off. But I would think carefully about how you can say it. Um, succinctly because we are reading lots of applications and, and lots of essays. But if, if I am engaged, if I'm interested in what I'm reading, I will never notice how long it is specifically. Good point. Good point. I also think it's a great way for you to see judgment on the part of the applicants. Exactly. Right. Do you know when to stop? Yes. Um, what about an addendum to address, let's say, a drop in grades or some other extenuating circumstances or a gap in employment if you're talking about an older uh, applicant? Does Duke Law find those kinds of addenda helpful, useful? Definitely so. Uh, you know, we, we encourage that. I, the one thing I almost always say when, you know, people say, well, what's, what's the biggest mistake or what, what, what advice do you give people? Don't leave, un, don't leave unanswered questions in an application. So if there's a class or a semester that has some anomalous grades compared to what else we're seeing, I can make some guesses about what might happen. I've seen enough applications that sometimes I'm right, but, but I shouldn't have to do that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a you know a lengthy labored explanation. Uh, it doesn't have to be more detailed or more personal than you're comfortable with. So you know, I mean, I've seen people who have had very difficult personal and family situations, and sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't know quite as much about that. But just enough for us to say, okay, I understand what was happening there. I can put that in in context um, again. And so again, if there's a gap in your resume. Uh, all, all kinds of things like that can, can be helpful for us to understand. We are well aware that we have been living through a pandemic for the last couple of years and are going to continue to see the effects of that, both academically and in terms of the opportunities that people have had for professional experience and so forth. So, you know, you can give us a little bit of information about that if, 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 it's, if it's been a significant effect. But, like, I understand that, that you know, there was a, a year, a semester or two when most schools went to either required or, or optional, uh, you know, pass fail grading and things like that. And we kind of understand that and we're, we, we remember it. Uh, so we'll, we'll be understanding of, of how that looks uh, as, as you go forward. Right. I once interviewed a medical school admissions director, and this was like, I think it was August 2020. So the, the epidemic was really at its height at that point in terms of restrictions and and the MCAT, unlike the LSAT and the G and the GMAT or the GRE, did not go online. Oh, so wow. there were several months at the at the height of the application cycle, the med application cycle, where there was no testing. Okay. And then I think in late July, something like that, they started to offering testing again, like around the clock practically. I mean, from six to I don't know, nine PM, some some crazy schedule. Um, so that people could apply. And uh, I was talking to a certain medical school admissions director. And of course, there was a lot of anxiety about, uh, you know, that taking classes online where previously medical schools hadn't accepted online classes. And then what are you going to do about the postponed test? And everybody's applying later and all this stuff. And finally, I said to the medical, and she was saying, no, we know, we know that there's a pandemic. We know that. So I said, oh, so you've heard about the pandemic. <laughs> and, and she first said, she, for a second, she thought I was serious. And then she she just started laughing because, of course, the schools know about it, whether it's law school or, or medical school, you're keenly aware of the pandemic. Let's mm-hmm. let's move on here. What factors, if any, do you weigh in addition to the test score and GPA? Well, I always like to point out that even those like those numbers have a lot of qualitative evaluation that goes into understanding what they mean. How did you arrive at a cumulative GPA? But but yeah, well, beyond that, you know, the, the things that we have available to us are the, you know, basically the resume, 
the essay and the letters of recommendation. So we're just interested in, in thinking about how people will connect with our community, where they're going to find opportunities to make a difference. So, you know, we look at how they've been involved in the communities they, they've been part of before. So, you know, in, in college, are you able to find things that you care about and put yourself into them uh, in enough in enough depth to make a difference? And, and again, you know, that could be law related. It could be mock trial in the pre-law society, but it could be something else altogether. So we're thinking a lot about people's ability to connect and, and contribute to a community, uh, their personal qualities. Like I said before, uh, are, people, are, are we going to enjoy being around them? Are they going to have something interesting to say to their classmates? Are employers going to, uh, you know, going to be able to say this to somebody that, that we'd like to hire? That manifests itself in lots of different ways. So, you know, it's not everybody has been president of an organization and everybody has had a particular job. Uh, and I am, you know, and I always remind myself and, and when I do training for application reviewers, try to really emphasize, you have to remember that there are people who have the luxury, the privilege to be able to take unpaid internships on Capitol Hill in the summer. And there are people that have to work during the summer, that people have to work full time during the school year and their resumes are going to look very different. And that's not a negative, right? Those are people who show tremendous work ethic and time management. We're learning different things from that, uh, but that's not to say that that's not something that we don't value and, and see as someone who we think could be a really valued member of our community. Um, and, but, and, and so I guess the other thing I'll say, you know, the, 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 the writing is the chance for us to hear an applicant's voice. Um, as you said, it's a judgment thing, how much they write, what they choose to write about, I like it when I do hear from people uh, in a broad, you know, I get a full, well-rounded picture of them. So personal statement required two optional essays, and they are truly optional, but really they give you opportunities to present different facets of your experiences, your interests. And that's all, those are often the people I come away from an application, just feeling like I know them better. So it is a service, you know, I think an applicant is doing a service to themselves to think about how they want to provide that information. But again, this is, comes back to what I said before, not out of a sense of obligation because an essay that is written because the space is available and I guess I better fill it, but I don't really have anything to say, that's not benefiting no. me, it's not benefiting you to take the time to write that. So when, you know, when it's there, we'd love to hear that. And then recommenders just give us that sort of third party check on, on what's going on. Sometimes we, sometimes they are better advocates for the applicant uh, than the applicant is themselves. Sometimes they're not the best writer, and I try to be aware that that's not something you can hold against the, the applicant. Uh, but just gives us a sense, like I said before, of how you've done in the classroom, how you engage with your classmates, if you had a job or an internship, how you handled that kind of professional setting. And just, you know, th those are all the pieces that help us say, and that's the most interesting thing, right? I mean, I can get a decent sense from glancing at a transcript and a test score, you know, a test score uh, report, I get a basic sense of somebody's academic ability, but they are very, very different when you dig into the other parts of the application. Yeah. That's the most interesting and the most rewarding part of it. And that's where people look, you know, look different and can rise above the pack or, you know, or not really do themselves <laughs> as many favors. Right, right. That is the more interesting part of their story. Not, it's not, just the GPA and the LSAT. I mean, you could have a computer analyze that. How do you view applications from students who've had academic infractions or perhaps a criminal record? A lot of that has to do with how they present that information and to some extent what, what, what the infractions right. are. Right. But I, in my experience, more often when we see somebody that we have some concerns about, it comes from feeling like they're not being fully honest and trying to minimize and deflect responsibility for what happened. You know, people make mistakes. Many of them are quite minor. Perhaps I should, <laughs> it's possible that I may have had a drink of alcohol before I was 21, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, you know, and, and like that, that happened. Um, it, it, early in college, you don't always know how to handle being an, you know, being in- Being an adult. Class and, right, so all, all kinds of things happen that are minor. Uh, some things are more significant, but all, all, especially very minor things, I might have driven above the speed limit once or twice. And if you just say, here's what happened, you know, I understand that it was a mistake, it's not a pattern, 
that kind of disclosure is totally fine. You know, that's not going to be a net, you know, really any speed bump at all. But when people seem like they're trying to deflect or minimize, especially when it's a school sanction and we have a letter from the school outlining what happened and it doesn't quite match up. And then I have to go back to the applicant and say, well, can you clarify this? Anything that slows, anything that slows down my review of your application and makes me do that kind of stuff is not going to be to your benefit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, more seriously, you know, I think we take cases of, of academic dishonesty more seriously, but again, that's not something that's in, insurmountable. Even, you know, even more serious criminal charges mm -hmm. and things like that. If, if we feel comfortable that at this moment you are going to be re recognized, you know, kind of the error of your ways, that at this moment you're going to be a, you know, a productive member of our communities, as some, you know, th then it's certainly possible to to get past that. So um, we just kind of take them as they come. But I think that's the really important thing is people just need to be be honest and and upfront about their disclosure and don't don't make us wonder, you know, is this there's something more here that we need to be digging into. Right. And also to have the character to take responsibility for exactly. their mistakes. Make a mistake. People make a mistake. They can I, I once uh I think it's uh, Jonathan Sachs wrote that um, a mistake that you don't learn from is a failure, but if you learn from it, it's a mistake. So <laughs> people make mistakes. Yeah, yeah, that happens. They'll do. It happens, like you said. All right, another question. Does Duke Law consider update letters from applicants who have something significant to tell you after they submit their application and before hearing back from you, or perhaps if waitlisted? So there's two different categories there. Sure. Any any additional information that people would like to have considered is definitely welcome to to add to the file. Love to have them by email. Sometimes people will call me up and want to talk about things, and I'm like, "Oh, I can talk to you, but I'm not the only person who needs to know this information. So could you please just write it down for me?" Um, but yeah, you know, and sometimes you know, sometimes significant things. If if a grade has changed or get in, you know, they get an internship or or things like that. We'd love to hear hear that. We we've been saying judgment a lot. And I think that's another thing is like how how much how important is it to keep us updated? But we'll always add things to the application file and, and consider it as part of our review. Similarly, you know, right now we're in the middle of a waitlist season and and receiving information from from applicants. Somebody's on the wait list. I, I hope they will check in with us. I would love to hear substantive updates if they have them. People who are graduating from college, you know, may have received honors or, you know, have summer plans that they didn't know about when they submitted their application. Um, but honestly, I, I encourage and, and we say in the information we provide to, to folks who are on our wait list, even if it's not a specific piece of news, uh, just checking in every now and then to keep on the radar and allow us to know that they're interested is actually very helpful. So I, I encourage that. Again, test of judgment, like not every day, but <laughs> you know, but but periodically, even if even if you don't have anything specific to say, but because if I, you know, if it's you know two weeks from now and we have the chance to admit people from the wait list, I'm much more likely to consider folks who I know, you know, in June at least have touched base with us than the people who we haven't heard from since February or March. Who knows what's happened to them? So substantive updates, but but also just kind of keeping the Keeping the lines of communication open is helpful with the wait list. Demonstrating interest, basically, appropriately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 just, I mean, it's it's a very fluid position on the part of law schools, but also on the part of the applicants. Everybody has their own timeline for how long they can hang on and be considered on a wait list before they say, "I have to put down a deposit on an apartment. I have to go it just for my own mental health. I need to commit to this. You know, to I need to commit to what I'm doing in the fall." Some people want to do that in April. Some people will wait until August before that, you know, before they do that. Right. Um, but I don't know for any individual person. So just knowing, yeah, just just knowing that that it's somebody that would be willing to consider uh, an offer of admission is really helpful for us. Okay, great, thank you. What is a common mistake you see applicants making during the application process? Well, I said before, you know, leaving unanswered questions. So I, I won't won't repeat too much of that. I can think of specific specific All example right. that. but I, well I, I don't know I mean I, it, it, it's in my head because the way that we've been talking about this but just not not telling us the things that you know telling us too much or too little right and that, that's all about judgment you go um, back to it. it it's a le one one lesson that I heard very early on in my professional career before I was in you know higher ed at all 
um, and I, you know, and I think about it, and I think other people should as well. Everybody that you interact with in the admissions process is getting an impression of you. And so when you come to our office to take a tour, you know, the person who is sitting at the reception desk is getting an impression of you. And sometimes I'll come out after a tour and go, hey, what do you think of those people? And if there's somebody who really impressed them, you know, it was impressive or good heavens, that guy was a jerk. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, make a note of that. Um, you know, email communication, it's an in, it is in some ways an informal, <laughs> an informal medium, but, you know, just knowing who you're talking to and, and being polite and, uh, you know, and, and respectful of, of the time. I, I try to be when I'm communicating with, with prospective students or admitted students and returning the favor to us is, is, is nice to do. Um, those are that minor is, things, but that is um, great. And so, no, I, I think it actually is really, really important. It's really important. We've talked, we, we, this isn't directly related to what you just, just said, which I think is a fantastic piece of advice, but I think Will Rogers, the writer and an American comedian from the 1930s, he is purported to have said that good judgment comes from experience and most of experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> right. Well, for most people, you're only going through the ad admissions process once, so you don't have- Well, you only want to go through it once. <laughs> to make those mistakes. Right, right. So exercise good judgment. And I think the point you're making about really every interaction is a reflection of you. And the less scripted ones can be sometimes more revealing, both for the positive and the negative. What would you like me to ask you? You've covered a lot of the bases. <laughs> I don't know that there's anything in particular that, that we haven't uh, that we haven't covered. You, you've done a great job. Well, thank you so much. Even if I got a few details pretty pretty wrong, um, <laughs> but I want to thank you for joining me and sharing your insider perspective. Where can listeners learn more about Duke School of Law? Sure. Well, uh, law.duke.edu is uh, is the website, and of course, the admissions subsection there has all the details about how to apply and so forth. But you can learn a lot about uh, about our programs and so forth. There's a great, I'll, the only other thing I'll direct you to is a section there called areas of focus, uh, mm -hmm. which is not, you don't have a major, you don't have like formal concentrations in, in law school or at Duke mm -hmm. anyway, but there's several areas where I think there's real strength in our faculty and course offerings. So um, corporate law, criminal law, environmental law, law and technology. And th there, that page has got a nice hub of all the faculty, all the courses, all the news, in those areas. So people might look at that and sort of begin to say, oh, that's something I want to know more about. And then you can drill down and say, well, what class does Jeff Ward teach about uh, artificial intelligence and, and stuff like that? Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you, listeners, also for joining me for this wonderful interview with Mark Hill, Senior Director of Admissions at Duke Law. We'll include links in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 481 to Duke Law's website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. Quick reminder, don't miss the law school admissions quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply and competitive at your Targo schools. Take the quiz at accepted.com slash law dash quiz today. This is Admissions Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.